here we are on that hillside. And we hear our commander. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which God the Lord has prepared. But you shall be witnesses. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and teach all nations and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things, whatever I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, right up to the end of the age. Now look. He's rising. He's rising. He's entering the cloud. He's disappeared. But now, can we follow him with eyes of faith? And it seems we can see dimly into the other side of eternity. What do we see there? We see a vast throng. We've already heard about it this morning. Gathered around the throne and we hear them and they're saying worthy is the lamb to receive power and riches and wisdom and honor and might and glory and blessing and if we listen carefully if we listen closely we can hear among that multitude we can hear the Fulani we can hear the Kutai the Mistek, the Yangna we can hear voices from Colombia, Dendi, Swahili, Shingali, American, Portuguese, Zulu, Greek, Romanian, and voices from the uttermost parts of the earth. Can we hear those voices? By faith, we can hear those voices. But now we hear the angel speaking. And the angel says, you men and women of all nations, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus that has ascended into heaven is coming back. And the text says they went back to Jerusalem. And so we, it's right that we at this time look to heaven, to our ascended Savior. But then we come back to earth. And we look at the harvest field. Jesus is coming back, the same Jesus. And we have work to do in the meantime. We have work to do in Mexico, in Nicaragua, in Indonesia, in Africa, in Colombia, in the uttermost parts of the earth. And we are convinced that this is the Messiah. And we're called to go. And we believe he's calling us to make disciples as we go. And all nations exist at a strategic time and place. And I believe it's all of our desires here in this place to fulfill the mission that our Lord has sent us to. The question is, how do we fulfill this mission? How shall it be done? Who am I? Who are we to do this? How shall we build on the one true foundation so that on that great day of fire, what is revealed is gold and silver and precious stones rather than wood, hay, and stubble. How shall we build on the one true foundation? And we already know that no man can lay another foundation. There is one foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. So we are weak. We're needed wisdom. Let us surrender to him. He will teach us how. I have five sections. I want to talk about some definitions, a little bit about resources, I'm going to talk about some examples, Anabaptists, and then finally counsel, a little bit of counsel for church planters. So definitions, first off. I'm sorry I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm sort of a low-tech guy. So if you want to take notes, you may do that. I have a quote here from Robert Ramsey here, uh, page 153, The Anabaptist and Mission, edited by Wilbur Schenck. It's a wonderful book for church planters. He says, the Anabaptist vision says that to be a Christian, one can have only one Lord, Jesus Christ, and that being Christian means being his disciple. 
This is what we believe. Being a disciple meant being called out of this world, whether that world was North American, Latin American, African, European, Asian, or Indonesian. Whether it is an Eastern or Western world makes no difference. Christian disciples, he says, live in a state of alienation from the natural societies in which they find themselves. Definition of the pilgrim church. Christian disciples living in a state of alienation from the natural societies in which they live. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? Here's the pilgrim church described by Jesus. He said, I have given them thy word in his prayer to the Father. And can you finish the rest of it? And the world, I've given them thy word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The pilgrim church is described by Peter, and we've already heard this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a called out nation, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you should show forth the excellencies of him, like the children of Israel were supposed to do when the traitors passed through that land, that you should show forth the excellencies of him, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. As Nicholas von Zinzendorf wrote, that in our fellowship there would be the sign or the, the, the beginnings of the new humanity. The pilgrim church is to show forth his excellencies. And now he goes further and says, the apostle Peter, he says, you were not a people, but now you are a people you didn't obtain mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. And he says, therefore, I beseech you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from, from the fleshly passions as pilgrims and strangers, exiles. The Pilgrim Church is a community of expatriates. That is, people living in a country whose citizenship is actually in another country. And Paul makes that very clear. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's the biblical definition of the pilgrim church. Uh, separated unto God, living in a state of alienation, hated by the world, a people for his own possession, exiles, expatriates. We don't really belong here. This is not our final home. Disciple-making community couple of definitions. And here again, I quote from Ramseer from page 182 of the same book, the um, Anabaptism and Missions by Wilbert Schenck. The Pilgrim Church is made up of people whose allegiance has shifted from allegiance to the institutions of human society to faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Such a people is truly the people of God. Now listen to this. The marks of peoplehood, the cultural traits which its members hold in common, that is the Pilgrim Church, which distinguishes them from those who are not of this people, those are the marks which come from following Christ and his teaching and the teaching of his apostles. Cultural traits of the, of the pilgrim church. In 1932, as his native Germany was coming under Hitler's power, a man by the name of Eberhard Arnold understood the strategic position of the pilgrim church. He said, he said in 1932, everything Everywhere, the world is going to pieces. It is crumbling and rotting away, going through a process of disintegration. It's dying. And in these fearsome times, he said, through the Holy Spirit, Christ places the city church with its unconditional unity right into the world. And the only hope for the world is to have a place of gathering. This world that's falling apart that's disintegrating, that's crumbling and rotting away. The only hope for this world is to have this place of gathering, to have a people whose will, undivided and free of doubt, is bent on gathering others into this same community. That is the pilgrim church as a disciple-making community. He went on to say, the church can be compared to a lantern. The light shines out through the glass to all the world. The rays of light are the brothers and sisters sent out on mission. They are messengers of God, messengers of light, angels of light, apostles of light, 
light rays of the gospel sent out by the light of the church. That is the mission of the pilgrim church, to send out. When that sending out stops, the pilgrim church has ceased to fulfill its full mission. So the mission of the pilgrim church is to reach out with the light and bring others into this place of gathering, the only hope for the world, this new nation, this people of God, whose allegiance is to Christ alone. And how does this happen? How are disciples made within the disciple-making community, the pilgrim church? You could say a lot of things. And I'll just summarize a few things at the beginning. It happens through baptism. It happens through the teaching and preaching of his word, through fellowship, through prayer, through the Lord's table, through exhortation and encouragement, rebuke and correction, confession of sin and walking in the light, through collective application of the scripture, through mutual submission in the rhythms of community life. And you can begin right now, brothers and sisters, you church planters who are living within the model of all nations, church planting teams, where you've got the translators and the community development, hopefully two or three couples out there working together. You can begin, begin all of this right here, this pilgrim church. This is how disciples are made over the long haul. I don't know of any shortcuts. So now some resources. I forget to bring my, forgot to bring my pile of books up here. But I think that Stanley Jones, E. Stanley Jones, and his ministry in the 20s and 30s in India and around the world deserves a study. The Christ of the Indian Road was the book that kind of set in motion the, the ideas of indigenous church planting. The Christ of the Indian Road. And of course, Curiavilla's book, King Jesus Claims His Church, many of you have probably read that. There's much resource there for church planting. I've mentioned the book Anabaptist in Mission, Mission by Wilbur Schenck. And then another book that should be read by Anabaptist church planters is the book written way back in the 80s by Theon Slabaugh, Gospel versus Gospel. And basically, his ideas there are how evangelical methods impacted the Mennonite church. And then um, another source and resource for me personally was while I was living at a, at a gated community courtesy of the U.S. government uh, some years, a few years back, I had the time to completely read through the martyr's mirror several times. And the heartbeat of these people who were the first missionaries out of the Reformation impacted me greatly. Another thing that has impacted me is for about 20 years, uh, our congregation has partnered with an Indian brother in southern India, Kerala State, along with um, the, the congregation from Shady Lawn, Arkansas, for a good bit of this time, for about 20 years now, our brother Jacob has uh, chosen to give his life to a people group of only about 40,000 living in the Western Ghats there in Southern Kerala State. And it's privileged to visit the work several times. One of the greatest experiences of my life was when we shared together <clears throat> at the Lord's table and, and I was able to um, wash I had the inestimable privilege of washing Brother Jacob's feet. These feet have now carried the gospel of peace for over 25 years. They were hardened and tough from walking the hundreds of miles on those trails, those mountain trails in that game preserve where these people live as squatters. Trails infested with cobras and other vipers in an area heavily populated with wild elephants. I was privileged to walk with Jacob on some of those trails and visit the villages. Now, he had a, he's had a long, hard slog as a missionary, as a near-cultural missionary to some of his own people, although they were, these people are tribal people, animistic, and do not share necessarily a, a Jacob's first language. He's given his life. He's given uh, 25 years now to these 40,000 people. And for many years, uh, the reports come back, 40, 50, 60 believers. And uh, we have a small nucleus of believers back there in those mountain villages, really no ordained pastors yet. All of a sudden, th something has happened. In the last six months to a year, he's sending us newsletters, and he sent a newsletter, said their wildest dreams have been exceeded. He said there's, there's 430 believers, he said, that have made the decision to follow Christ back there. And uh, they need baptism. They do not have the personnel to go back there, especially with COVID right now to baptize those people. It's an amazing work of God, and we're, we're removed from it. 
Uh, we do very little except to pray and offer some support and visit occasionally. But the Lord is at work around the world. <clears throat> He's pouring out his blessing. 2020, another influence for me, we visited, we went to Ireland to serve in our community at Dunmore East, which incidentally was uh, started or established, helped established by Brother Joel's grandfather. And we planned to move to Europe for the rest of our lives. But then, uh, and we wanted to uh, become members of the EU, and our dream was to send our children out across the EU block as missionaries. Well, that dream uh, is partially realized, even though we, we needed to return from Ireland. So just a few um, disclosures there as to what has affected my thinking. Let's go to some examples. Let's go to Rwanda in 1994. Most of you probably remember or have heard about that this horrible period, about 100 days, about 800,000 to a million uh, Tutsi and Hutu people died in civil ethnic cleansing, genocide. What we might forget is that at the time, Rwanda was considered one of the most Christianized nations in the whole world. 90% of Rwand Rwandan citizens identified as Christian. The Anglican Church, which, uh, of which Roland Allen was affiliated with, had a big part in evangelizing Rwanda. But in 1994, Christians, Christians slaughtered their Christian neighbors with machetes and hatchet. And I know this is an extreme example, and it's a horrible and tragic and complicated story. But what makes the story even more tragic is that Rwanda was the place where that great African revival the East African Revival began in the 1930s. And now 60 years later, Christians were killing one another. What went wrong with Rwanda's kind of Christianity? Now fast forward to Kenya, six years later, year 2000. Here is William Andeo. I knew him for only about four and a half months in the time, the time we spent in, India, in, uh, in Kenya. He is a deacon at a church, and he told me this story. This man, I have never forgotten him. I, like I said, only knew him for a short time, but his sweet spirit, gentle spirit, it just impacted me like actually few men have. So <clears throat> that day, his daughters went to the village well to get water. And the man in charge of the well didn't like Brother William because of his association with the Pilgrim Church. His daughters waited in line for a long time. Finally, it was their turn to fill their containers. They got to the front of the line, filled their water containers with water, and then what happened next is this guy, take, as I remember the story, takes their water containers and he turns them upside down, empties out the water, and sends them to the back of the line where they have to wait for another, who knows, an hour or more. And they went back to their father's home crying without water. Now, Brother William was a baptized brother, kind of young in the faith, and at that moment, the old William came back. He was filled with the spirit of fighting and violence. And he set off for that man's house, intending to give him a good thrashing. But on the way there, he started thinking. And he remembered the teaching that he got from the Sermon on the Mount about loving your neighbor and doing good to those who spitefully use you. And Brother William got a hold of himself by the Spirit of God, turned around, went back to his house, gathered up a couple of kilos of precious maize, corn, and took it over to his dumbfounded enemy and gave it to him. I'm telling you, that, that is a cultural trait of the people who are part of the new people of God, the Pilgrim Church. Now let's rewind all the way back to 1782. And I, I hope I'm not making this so theoretical, but there's these stories of the Pilgrim Church across various times and places and, and denominations. Some of you have probably visited these places, Gnadenhutten and Schoenbrunn in eastern Ohio, Moravian communities. And you know this story, some of you I'm sure do. Through the work of David Zeigsberger and others over decades and decades, Many of the Lenape tribe were converted. Several communities were established. These were First Nations people. And they were warring. There was a warring tribe. But they embraced, many of them, the gospel of peace. 
And they were trained in that gospel. And they laid down their tomahawks and their knives. And they embraced non-resistance. They were taught to live in the spirit of peace, to live in harmony, in community with one another. And working together industri industriously, they established several communities. And <clears throat> they established a biblical culture that was separated from their own roots and the American culture of its day. Men and ladies were taught modesty. The lady members were taught to cover. Can you imagine? First Nation ladies in the 1700s were taught to cover their heads. They learned hymns of faith. And I think that church planters who are interested in the Pilgrim Church model should study the history of those early Moravian communities. One place to start would be Peter Hoover's online book, Behold the Lamb. They have much to tell us. Of course, there were the excesses, and I understand the doctrinal differences and all that. The spirit of Christ was there. So since these First Nations people now refused to take side in the conflict between the British and the Americans of the day because of their non-resistance, both governments viewed them with suspicion, and they suspected them to be sympathizers with the other side. And they were sympathizers, all right. They sympathized with Jesus' kingdom, and they sympathized with the suffering poor. So in the fall of 1781, some of these Lenape Indians were forced to relocate by the U.S. military. But in the spring, they were going hungry. So some of them decided to go back, to sneak back into their old area and harvest the corn that was still standing and bring it back so they could survive the winter. But they were surprised by the U.S. militia who arrested them, this group of about 100 of them. And they rounded them up and they, they, they accused them of participating in raids into Pennsylvania, which they denied and which they were not guilty of. And the soldiers, nonetheless, voted to kill them. They, just, they made a deliberate decision to kill them. And when these dear Lenape pilgrim Christian believers heard about this, they requested time to prepare to die. The men were put in one building, the women and children in another building for the night. And there those dear believers spent the night in prayer and singing hymns of faith as they prepared to die. Next morning, one of the great stains upon U.S. history. U.S. military brought those people out, 96 of them, and they clubbed them on the head with a mallet. Then they scalped them and killed them. 96 of our brothers and sisters martyred in this way. Now, my question for the church planters is this. What is the difference between the Rwanda Christians in 1994, William Andeo in 2000, and the Lenape believers in 1792. What is the difference between the type of churches represented? I'll tell you the difference. William Andeo and the Moravian Indians were part of disciple-making communities who taught the way of Jesus' radical love by word and by example over time. You see, the Lenape believers did not put away their tomahawks overnight. It took time and more time. Now, in contrast, Christianity in Rwanda, Timothy Longman wrote a book, Christianity and Genocide in Rwanda. And he says that Rwandan Christians did not contribute to the genocide due to a nominal faith. Instead, he claimed that something in the very nature of the Christianity in Rwanda made it unwilling or unable to restrain the genocide. And he goes on to say, Rwanda's Christian leaders cultivated an atmosphere where good practicing Christians could kill their neighbors without feeling that they were acting inconsistently with their faith. Good Christians could kill their neighbors without feeling like they were acting inconsistent. I know this is extreme. I know it is. But it's shocking. It's shocking. But I ask you, is it any less shocking that the leaders of much of American Christianity cultivated and have cultivated right down from the beginning of American history. They have cultivated an atmosphere where good practicing Christians can kill the enemies of America without being inconsistent to the Christian faith. I ask, is there something wrong with that kind of Christianity? So now let's talk about Anabaptism and missions. Now most of us 
have grown up probably in a conservative Anabaptist community. Many of us might have reacted to our background, or maybe we're reacting today. Probably some of us are. That's just normal. We react to our background to some degree at some time, and yours truly is included in that. We, we get disillusioned by the quirks, by the inconsistence and failures of God's people. But there is much to praise God for, brothers and sisters, in our heritage. For one thing, we have not taken part in American militaristic expansion here in North America or in military inventions, interventions around the world. We've not been part of the international imperialism where the missionary follows the military. Now, where our mission methods need correction, we want to humbly acknowledge it and seek by the grace of God to seek a better way. But the mission churches that are scattered here and there around the world, the ones that have been established by conservative Mennonites and Anabaptists represented by the type represented in this room, there are about two or 300 of them, by the way, around the world that have been established in the last five, 50, 60 years, something like that. Those churches require an obedience from their brothers and sisters, by and large, that could only be considered radical discipleship compared to much of what you see in the mass movements. We have, here's some of the strengths. We have a strong spirit of community, which trait is helpful in relating to strong group cultures around the world. This is something that, by and large, because of the influence of the Western uh, and American, this idea of rugged individualism that is so affected our culture that many American Christians are not blessed with this spirit of strong group spirit of community. We like to do things as a group, just like the Muslim peoples, the Hindu peoples, and most other non-Westernized people groups. I think this is one of the reasons that my friend Carl Gordon, who is a senior staff at a, a significantly large um, mission uh, sending, or I should say sponsoring organization, they sponsor uh, I think three to 5,000 missionaries around the world, he says he feels that the Mennonite Christians are among the best positioned to reach the Islamic peoples. And one reason was because of their strong sense of community. We are set apart from the mainstream, and this set-apartness by the grace of God is not just all historical culture or ethnic markers. What sets us apart by the grace of God, A, a certain understanding of the gospel, B, an understanding of what it means to love our fellow man, C, a particular way of understanding the structures and systems that drive modern society, D, a certain way of looking at the future, and E, but not least, last but not least, a brotherhood hermeneutic of interpreting and applying scripture. I think we need all of these ideas and concepts in our church planting. A, a, a right understanding of the gospel, an understanding of what it means to love our fellow man, the right way to understand the structures and systems that drive the, the spirit of the age, looking at the future, and a brotherhood hermeneutic of both interpreting and applying scripture. You know, in the mission impulse that drove our movement at the beginning is not dead. Do we have a lot to learn? I want to quote from a brother that I love dearly. I've never met him, Brother Mark Yoder, who's in, who is in Costa Rica or is he in Nicaragua? I don't remember. But the love that I feel from him, from the warmth that has come through his writings, 63 years old, lifelong pastor missionary down there in Central America. Here's what he wrote me the other day. This has been his life. He says, I'm really only a learner. <laughs> that is an example for us to follow. I have so much to learn, but I enjoy the work and I'm so glad to have a small part in his work. I too get all excited about this subject. This has been my life and the passion of my life. I hope all of you church planters and those supporting church planting out here today can have that same kind of passion. And he's had some failures and setbacks and struggles, and he acknowledges that the methods, uh, you know, could be improved. But we praise the Lord for the Anabaptist people. There are many things that remain, things to be straightened and build up. I have a son presently living in Dunmore East in our community there. Uh, he's in the States right now. But there they call them the Hamish, the Hamish people. And... Uh, Jonathan said to me the other day, he said, you know, he thinks that little community is flourishing. And we were there in January, and we got up there, we got to church Sunday morning, and the brother who led the, the singing was, was Polish. 
The brother who had the Sunday school, the brother who had devotions was German. The brother who had Sunday school class was Ukrainian. And the brother who had the sermon was American. A wonderful mix of international fellowship. We sometimes rather depreciatingly call ourselves the quiet in the land. To the extent that is true, I say it's because we need a fresh vision of that risen Savior standing there triumphant on the Mount of Olives just before he ascended. We need to get a fresh vision of his power and his authority, which he just demonstrated all throughout his ministry. And he says now, he says, all authority has been given to me, so go and make disciples. Did you know that from about 1525 to about 1575, and I know that's a long time ago, but even beyond that, we were known as the thunder in the land, a term I made up. But did you know that the Anabaptists were the pioneer missionaries, the pioneer church planters coming out of the Reformation? They were the first church planters. Did you know that? How many of you knew that? A few of you know that. Quite a few of you know that. But all of us need to know that, especially you church planters. The, initially, the movement spread like wildfire as the churches were started in kind of a mass revival movement. And that's why the civil authorities took such extreme measures to crush it. But the truth is the reformers didn't wake up to the need of missions and church planting until about 200 years later when William Carey went to India. That is why I think that all nations' personnel should make it a priority to study the missionary endeavors of their own heritage. And that's why, again, I recommend Wilbert Schenck's collection of essays. You know what, but we went from being the thunder in the land to being the quiet in the land. We got hounded by persecution, we fled to America, we set up our lovely communities while people like David Zeigsberger and the other Moravian missionaries went to the First Nations communities and called them into kingdom way of living. You know, and we have much to repent from, for being so quiet, for losing our first calling. But you know, in the last century, the Anabaptist people have started waking up. As it relates to world missions and planting churches in other lands, this began to happen about 100 to 120 years ago. Now, the question is, did this reawakening happen because the Anabaptist peoples rediscovered their missionary heritage? You know something? The 20th century Anabaptists largely picked up their mission impulse and mission methods from the modern Protestant mission movement. This is the argument of Theron Slabaugh's book, Gospel versus Gospel. And it's important that not only did the Mennonite missionaries, the American Mennonites, they not only absorbed Protestant mission methodology, but they picked up elements of the Protestant gospel along with it with far-reaching effects, many of them negative. We have to be discerning as we study uh, methods of missiology. There's an often repeated saying in regards to media that goes something like this. The medium is the message. That means that, okay, so just the way the information comes to us uh, changes us and conveys a certain message. Now, I'd like to raise this question in relation to mission methods. Is it possible that the method, at least in part, is the message? Is it possible that the method is the message, at least in part? If that were true, we should be very discerning about our methods. One of the biggest omissions I see in some of the missiologists, like the popular ones that we do study and that people like SMBI use, and I know that All Nations is interested in using, one of the biggest omissions I see in a lot of that material is the concept of a brotherhood hermeneutic and application of scripture as a community, and also radical faithfulness to the Sermon on the Mount. We, so we want discernment as we study methods of missiology. Now I have some counsel for church planters. I'm at point number five. <clears throat> but here's where most of the subpoints are. So <clears throat> if you're writing, you have to write fast. I prepared a list of things that I call Council for Anabaptist Church Planters. And there's some caveats. They're not Bible. They're not the, they're not the uh, reflections of a seasoned missionary or church planter. They're not the views of a particularly wise or gifted person. 
just the perspectives of one little man. And my modest goal is to help with the discussion. And I invite your criticism and your evaluation, your careful evaluation. <clears throat> I wonder if I could have a glass of water up here. <clears throat> Thank you, brother. Number one, I want to say church planters and all of us really, all of us missionaries here in America, we got to keep the vision of the risen Christ, the ascended Christ, in front of our eyes. Yielded to him with this vision of who he is and what he's done, we can make disciples. Yes, the conservative and a Baptist can make disciples. Did you ever think about the fact that the gospel was first planted into the world? The first churches were planted by the most, probably the most exclusive, restricted people group in the world. They were the ones in charge with the responsibility of spreading the gospel into the world. But that gospel was so powerful because they caught a vision of this risen Christ and they, they, they broke out of whatever traditions were holding them back and they faithfully conveyed the word of God and the message of Christ to the world. And here we are today. And conservative and a Baptist Christians can fulfill the Great Commission with the power of the Holy Spirit. I like Mark's rendering of Jesus' call to his disciples at the beginning. Mark has Jesus saying, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Process. So we're in it. We're disciples ourselves. Number two, keep the cross in front of your eyes. The risen Christ gives us power, but the crucified Christ helps keep us broken. Three, I suggest read and reread the book of Acts on your knees until you are convinced that the same things could happen in your setting. And I suggest read it with your fellow missionaries or fellow pastors. I understand this is how the East African revival with all its imitations started. Missionaries reading the book of Acts and believing the same things are possible. Four, I suggest discover the Anabaptist heritage of missions. Have I mentioned Wilbur Shank's collection of papers written by various Mennonite scholars? Uh, the chapters include The Anabaptist Theology of Missions by Franklin Little, Anabaptist Understanding the Good News, Cornelius Dick, The Anabaptist Approach to Mission, Hans Konsdorf, The Anabaptist Vision, and Our World Mission by Robert Ramsier, whom I've quoted. Number five, make present day use of Anabaptist church planters and church planting resources. Make use of those brothers who, who are out there who are working who, who may be using, shall we say, imperfect methods. But I think we would be proud if we were not to learn from them and seek their counsel. And I have, uh, I have a whole list of things that Brother Dan Yoder, who's been in Ireland for tw almost 25 years now, I've got a list of things from Brother Dale Heisey, who's been on the mission field for 30 years down there in Central America. And I've got a whole list of things... For, pages and pages from this brother Mark Yoder. If you want to see the, some of the things he's written, I will be happy to get them to you. I actually sent him the questions, brother Mark, that we're going to be addressing in the panel discussion today. So much good counsel. Finney Kirkeville is not an Anabaptist, but he has written a book that can help guide the work that all nations is called to do. Six, study the mission methods of like-minded groups throughout history. Missionary enterprise of the early Hutterites, amazing story, and the stories of the Bruderhof and the Moravians also come to mind. Seven, I say, do not use Protestant mission methods uncritically. We can, we can use what's good, but not use them uncritically. Don't let biblical practices slip away through uncritical use of Protestant methods. I remember we got to Kenya in 2000, and when we got there, we discovered there was a common lament this came from the, the Kenyans as well as from the American missionaries. They said, Christianity in Kenya is a mile wide, but an inch deep. Does that describe much of Christianity in the world? Eight, do not compromise the gospel or New Testament doctrine. Don't make, I have three points under this, don't make the narrow gate wider than it is. Only those who are who demonstrate absolute surrender to Christ should be baptized. And I know we probably have different perspectives on the whole baptism thing in this room. I'd like to hear some of them. Now, I, our dear friend Jacob in India, he told me some years ago, 
And that was before we'd even discussed how to do this. I don't think it was influenced by the way our churches practice it. He said, when a new believer comes to Christ, he likes to watch them for several months to be sure that they are committed Christians. But maybe we can discuss this some more during the panel. Underneath not compromising the gospel or New Testament doctrine, there's much could be said about this particular point, but do not neglect discipline. You know, due to the, the Anabaptist concept has, has, has included the concept of discipline of erring members for the purpose of restoration. And this, this is something that's pretty much fallen down in modern Christianity. Do not neglect discipline. And, I, and here I'm going to address a specific issue, if you don't mind. I'm going to address the, the biblical doctrine of covering for the ladies. You know, I'm aware that sometimes there are questions like this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to teach and preach the, the, the truth about the Christian woman's veiling in a culture that's so different from mine, but I do not feel that I can make it a requirement. How do we think about you know, questions like that? We teach and preach it, but how can we make it a requirement in this indigenous church we're about to try to plant? I ask the question, how is that not a compromise? Has a disciple truly learned from his teacher in the biblical sense of discipleship if truth taught isn't obeyed? Now, I know what we're dealing with in this particular issue, and this is one of the many issues that we face um, on the mission field. I remember uh, one of the times I visited India. Our dear brother Jacob's wife covers, and they want the rest of the believers in India that, that come to Christ to also cover. So he asked me, would I bring a message uh, on the Lord's Day on this particular topic? So I went into the church, little church chapel there, beautiful scene, men and women seated on mats on the floor, the ladies wearing their saris, beautifully, modestly dressed, and they pull their saris forward, beautifully covered, um, very well covered, very adequately covered. And I, I brought the 1 Corinthians 11 principles to them. And I preached to them that this principle is based on the creation principle, which exists. There is no time that it ever takes a recess. So probably the way the Lord would have us practice this practice is continually whenever a woman is in waking hours so that she can be prepared to prophesy or to pray, whatever. And I went down that line. And so then I sat down. And the dismissal was given, and I had my eyes open. Would what I said in about 20 minutes make any difference at all? You know something? <laughs> Those dear Indian believer ladies, they went out of that church house, and instantly, you know, back they went to their everyday attire. So what I said didn't really make a difference. I understand the struggle. But here's where perseverance comes in. And Dale Heisey told me something. He said, we've got to have the faith that these people can actually uh, do the things that we teach them. And a place to start on this particular issue, among many other issues, would be to read Brother Finney Curievilla's chapter in his book, King Jesus Claims His Church, on the Christian woman's covering. I think we, we shouldn't, I don't think we can neglect any particular doctrine that we have a particular revelation on. If we neglect something that the Lord has taught us, I fear it will lead to other compromises that will not be good. Number nine, do invest for the long haul. Do not move on too quickly. And I know this might again kind of fly in the face of some of the missiology that we're considering here uh, and that could possibly be an improvement on some of the methods we have now. But the fact is there are many things that new converts need to be taught. I'm going to give an example here, another historical example. I hope it's not too theoretical. Many of us have heard of the Welsh Revival in 1904 and 1905. And you know, we think, I mean, we, understandably, these revivals are what we want to see around the world. Uh, Evan Roberts, his preaching, the powerful demonstration of the Holy Spirit, but most of all, the changed lives. Jails emptied out. I think statistics show that for five years in the area, drunkenness was reduced by 50% in that part of Wales. It made a huge cultural impact, just like Christianity should. 
So we've heard of the Welsh Revival, but have we heard of the squelching of the Welsh Revival? Do you know how that happened? I have a dear brother back there at Dunmore East, uh, brother Hugh Gregory Smith. I don't think he'd mind if I'd use his name. He used to be a vicar in the Anglican Church in Wales. And his parish, before he left the Anglican Church on account of ordination of women and some other things like that, his parish was right there in Wales, right there at uh, Newquay and other places where the Welsh revival took place like 100 years before. And he preached in some of those very chapels that I think Evan Roberts would have preached. He held funerals and marriages, whatever else a vicar does in the Anglican Church, his parish included. So I got to ask, well, this is really interesting. Wow, this Welsh revival, what, you know, what's still going on there today? And he told me a story. He said that one time he was ministering to a, an older woman who was on her deathbed. I think he conducted her funeral then. And she happened to be one of the daughters of one of Evan Roberts' singers. Now, Evan Roberts, when he conducted his revivals, he would have singers, ladies, come along, and they would sing and make music, and it would be, contribute to the work that God was doing. And here was a daughter of one of those ladies. And I think he thought that, wow, this woman probably has holy memories of those times. But you know, he said he was surprised. That woman seemed almost embarrassed to even want to talk about her mother's experience in the Welsh revival. She kind of wanted to remove herself from it. So I began to ask my brother Hugh, what do you think happened? He said, World War I. 1904, 1905 this happened. When was it? By um, 1918, 1718, the Welsh boys were called off to fight for their country. And it destroyed whatever God was doing there. What would have happened if, what would have happened <clears throat> if the leaders of that movement had persevered, had taught the way of Christ through the years, had taught against war and state-sponsored killing, might there still be kingdom churches in Wales today? We need stable people who are there for the long haul. And I know it's ideal to ordain national leaders as quickly as possible. I'm all for that. The work in Kenya, I think, has 60, 75 percent national leaders now in church at Rabor, where my brother William is. It's uh, like fully autonomous now, or it's got its own national leadership. We want that. But at the same time, much harm has been done through ordaining too quickly and putting leadership in place too quickly, unstable leadership who does not understand the way of Christ. They can't. They haven't been taught. Discipleship happens line upon line, line upon line, over a period of time. We want the quantum leap. The giant leap forward. Brothers and sisters, sometimes that happens. And it happened in the book of Acts, and sometimes it happens today. But from my observation, most of the time, it's line upon line, the daily rhythms of life in a pilgrim community that bring us to Christ-likeness, that help us grow. I don't have a lot of answers here. But I do think of Sanford Yoder and the Nicaraguan churches. There are about 10 churches down there now, and I know this is a model that we're trying to improve on. I'm, I'm honest about that. I, I think we should, we should learn what we can and try to improve. But you know something, though? Those Nicaraguan churches, there's about eight or 10 of them now, started since about, what was it, 2000? But that story didn't just happen two years ago. It didn't start two years ago. It started when Brother Sanford Yoder left Virginia and moved to Costa Rica, I think it was in 1969. A generation of missionaries was raised up. And so I say, brothers and sisters, your impact on the world, your greatest impact on the world, church planters, might not be the churches you plant, but it might be the churches your children plant because they have learned the culture. And I say that this work is worth studying. One of the things that's worth studying is that I talked to um, Brother Mark about this. He talked to me, or was it Brother Dale? They send two or three families out from their planting church, kind of like All Nations is doing. They start with that nucleus, and then from there, the church grows. So I, my next point was, do capitalize, number 10, on the nucleus of the two to three families that All Nations envision. And I say, do establish your own Lord's Day gathering as soon as it is feasible, even if there are only a few of you, while being friendly to any neighboring churches and visiting them too. 11. Do not focus on the number of converts. Jesus focused on a faithful few. We should too. 
If God gives both numbers and faithfulness, then we have the book of Acts again. But we better have an Apostle Paul and a Barnabas and a John, and a John Mark and um, all the other apostles to help support what is growing. Continually seek humility, number 12. And I see this trait in the lives of the long-term missionaries that I know. Their idealism has been tempered through trials. And I say, let not him that puts his armor on boast like the one who takes it off. 13, study and capitalize on the Anabaptist strong group mentality. And again, I repeat this because I think this is a point of mutual cultural affinity with many people groups around the world. This is the type of culture into which the gospel first came, strong group culture. And among many things, this trait can be very useful in teaching new people, new people groups who are Christians a collective application of scripture. 14, go as learners. Go as, we've already heard about that. There's so much to be said about that. Now I come to point number 15, and I have one more after that, short one. And I'm quoting here from Dale Heisey now. Use, I don't know how to pronounce this word, auto. Can somebody help me? Autochronous methods of applying scripture. It means from the ground up. I just want to read something that Brother Dale sent me. He says, first generation Christians must be taught, but not told. They will just become parrots and live by rote if you simply tell them what they need to know. So he says, we're studying this Bible passage or lesson or doctrine. And our nature drives us to explain it, tell it, emphasize it, illustrate it until they come to accept it. Wrong method. Yes, it is right to conduct the study, to introduce it, to bring all of us to the passage in view, and we can read it together, one of the disciples can read it, or the teacher can read it, but then we must turn to someone in the class and ask them, what do you find in verses 4 and 5? And what does this say to you? And how do you think Christ would have you to experience this in your life? And what difference might this make in your life were you to choose to include this teaching in your home? Does this teaching harmonize with what you've already learned. So they find the lessons written here and learn to find in the given verses the principles and they explain how they come to understand it. And then the teacher guides them into application and they, but they make those decisions. 16, this is my last point on, on uh, counsel to church planters. Don't neglect the nearest culture of all, your own family. I believe you will likely make the biggest impact through your own children. I will tell you a story at the end. This story is very touching to me because this brother was in my youth group. And um, now he's not a Mennonite. I'll be up front with that. And he has some doctrines that he believes in uh, that we would really not like. But I say this story because it's a very recent story. And it's an example of what can happen with a person who is so constrained by the love of God and is willing to suffer in spite of some things that might be wrong about his doctrine or methodology. It's an example of someone who has seen the vision of Christ in his authority and is willing to follow him at any cost. Uh, less than a year ago, I sat with a table in our gym there where we have fellowship hall and he started telling me this story and he had to break off at the most exciting part but I got the rest of it from other people. Floyd is his name, his real name, Floyd. He and his wife got the vision to move to southern Philippines. There is a Marxist rebel group down there. I forget the name of that rebel group. Some of you have studied that culture and know what, which one it is. Very dangerous area. One of the most dangerous, well, it's an area where persecution exists and dangerous for Americans to be there. They chose to move in with a people group who's animistic and um, a sort of um, animistic type people. Right in the middle of where these Marxist guerrillas are. They moved down there with their two children. I think this happened in 13 or 14, somewhere in there. Bought some land, pineapple plantation, started raising pineapples, and we're gonna subsist on what they can get off the pineapples. Self-supporting, I believe, mostly. And this man has a passion for the word and a passion for the Lord. He started teaching the people. They got in there because they had a contact who was American educated at the edge of the mountains near where the trail went in over the mountains. And this friend who lived in the Philippines, who was Filipino, 
but American educated, helped them get in. So with his help, they were able to get into this village and they had to, for the first uh, year, uh, half a year or more, there was no road, so they had to carry everything the last, I think, three or four miles over a couple mountain ridges back to where they set up and started living. Now, this all happened so fast, but they realized they were in trouble when that mayor was brutally killed by the guerrillas for helping them. This happened uh, less than a year, I think, after they were there. Now, this was an audacious thing to do, really. I mean, it was totally audacious. Who does this? Really no training. I don't think they ever went to school. I doubt if they had the preparation that all nations personnel has. Just a burning heart for the Lord and an understanding of the grace of God. They just wanted to tell people about Jesus. So they went back there, and then this mayor was massacred or executed. And, wow, they knew they were in trouble. And about that time, the guerrilla bands started coming into the mountains around them, and one night they massacred a bunch of people in the neighboring villages, but they didn't come to their village. And now they were thinking, well, we need to get out of here. But the police said, it's too dangerous for you to walk the trails. Stay where you are. We'll try to protect you. Well, they went on with their lives the best they could. After a year, year, year and a half maybe, it was time to harvest those pineapples. So they loaded up a pickup truck with pineapples. And by that time, they had a road back to at least partway back and Brother Floyd started off down the road toward town. They ambushed him. I think they, threw a, they pushed a young boy out into the road ahead of him, and he had to break to avoid hitting him. He might have hit him just a little bit, and they used that as an excuse to mob him. And they took his head. By the way, he, they had told him, we're going to come after you next. He knew it. They took him, and <clears throat> this is a guy I was in the youth group with. They took him and got up on him and slammed his head repeatedly against the pavement until they fractured his skull, eighth of an inch or a quarter inch wide, skull fracture. He was unconscious, brutally injured, tra head trauma. I don't remember, I don't know all the details that happened right there, but somehow the police came, they rescued him, or they left him from dead, and the police came, they evacuated his family, took him to the hospital where he took a long time recovering. And he was in the city then, I don't know which city, but he, Brother Floyd, he uh, felt like he was a failure. He invested everything in that piece of property back there. Now he can't go home because the doctor said that you can't fly because of the air pressure. It could rupture blood vessels in your brain and you could die on the airplane. He was in, down in the Philippines for a couple years basically doing nothing until... One day, a man came from the village. He had heard what happened and looked Floyd up in the village and started contact with him. And I don't remember all the details, but at some point, this man said, hey, hey can, you, uh, can you tell us a little more about this grace you were talking about to us back there? Oh, boy, could he ever. And he started telling them the gospel. And this man got converted. And more men came. And soon they were bringing him out by the truckload and sitting on his porch in town. He was teaching and preaching them. This is an ordinary guy like you and I with a passion for Christ and his kingdom. And they, those believers went back, and soon there were baptisms. And then after a while, he actually commissioned or ordained a couple of brothers to be the leaders back there in that little village. And he had left a cell phone back there so he could be in contact by phone and give him, teach him how to preach and teach him sermons and stuff. And he was sitting there less than a year ago at that table on a folding chair, and I'm sitting there next to him. He said there's uh, 70 or 80 baptized believers back there now. One man with a vision and a commitment to follow Christ down the pathway of suffering. So I say to you, this could probably be point number 617. Accept suffering as a missionary, accept suffering as a church planting method.